All right, so now welcome uh, to this um, AQ uh, analysis, uh, quantum fields and probability seminar. Um, she, you graduated from Hamburg in uh, 2009, I believe, uh, uh, after which you had uh, postdocs uh, also in Hamburg and in Rome, uh, followed um, and after which then you took up um, a permanent position at uh, the University of York, where you are still, apparently, and um, it's a great pleasure to have you and hear about symmetries in interpretive algebraic quantum field theory. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to uh, speak at the seminar series. Um, so yeah, today I wanted to tell you a few things about um, my recent work with uh, Romeo Brunetti, Michel Dusch, and Klaus Renhagen, uh, and also about the relation to my a bit older work uh, on uh, symmetries in, uh, well, essentially perturbative algebraic quantum field theory, but also with the outlook on non-perturbative uh, story. <clears throat> okay, so let's get started. And please, if you have any questions, then uh, don't hesitate to interrupt me. Uh, all right, so, well, so here, here is the main uh, talk that I'm going to um, present. So uh, it's called the unitary master word identity time slice axiom, Nutter's theorem and anomalies. And I think one of the well, features of, of that uh, paper uh, was to uh, try to combine concepts like interaction, uh, renormalization, anomalies, and symmetries in a framework which is compatible with um, the AQFT spirit and uses nets of sister algebras. So um, well, somehow the ambition was to try to um, well package some of the things we very well know in perturbative AQFT also in a way uh, which is more sister algebraic. Um, okay, and well, I guess all of you or most of you know what's algebraic quantum field theory, but uh, uh, well, for that one person in the room who might not know, uh, here is just a reminder. So, um, well, it goes back to the framework of Hagen and Kassler, where uh, it was developed as conceptual framework for formulating QFT on Minkowski space stem. This is where QFT started. And um, the idea was to characterize the theory by saying, well, what observables can be associated to bounded regions of space stem. And the first property that was um, required was had something to do with the notion of subsystems. So this is the isotony axiom. So if there is a larger region, there is a larger algebra of observables. So this is uh, how one arrives at the structure of a net. And there are also further axioms that uh, make sense in that context, so they are physically motivated. There is the causality saying that observables in space like separated regions should commute. And the time size axiom saying something about the dynamics. So if you start with a neighborhood of a Cauchy surface and you consider the algebra there, that should be already isomorphic to the algebra of the region you, you get as, um, well, the region whose Cauchy surface this was. And this got then generalized also to curved space time. So it's not just Minkowski and also to the perturbative setting where these algebras are no longer sister algebras. Okay, so in a more general setting, uh, the input is, uh, well, any Lorentzian space time, which is nice enough. And by nice enough, I mean uh, globally hyperbolic. So there is a Cauchy surface there. And uh, well, one also needs to specify what, what kind of uh, theory we want to consider. So what sort of configuration space, uh, so scalars, vectors, tensors, and so on. And typically, uh, this is the space of smooth sections of some vector bundle over M. And here are some examples. So the scalar field, um, apologies if you hear the noise, this is unfortunately the neighbor uh, doing some renovation. Um, 
so sorry about that. I hope you can hear me despite it. Uh, all right, so for the scalar field, we have smooth functions on um, the manifold. For young mills, we have um, sections of, um, um, yeah, we have, so, uh, again, of some vector bundle, one forms with values in the Lie algebra. And then for uh, effective quantum gravity, these are metric perturbations. And I will always use phi to denote a generic element of the configuration space. Now for the dynamics, we are going to use a version of Lagrangian formalism. So uh, here the model is essentially given in terms of a Lagrangian, starting from a Lagrangian. Um, so the idea for constructing models here goes back to well, a very recent paper of Buchholz and Frenhagen, where they gave an outline of how C star uh, algebra. A net of sister algebras uh, corresponding to an interacting quantum field theory from a Lagrangian uh, can be constructed. Um, and well, the idea is to, well, it's very simple actually. So you first look at the abstract sister algebra, which is generated by a collection of unitaries, and then you uh, quotient by some relations. And those unitaries have the physical interpretation of local S matrices. And uh, well, this is somewhat motivated by uh, the local S matrices we know from perturbative AQFT, and I will give some more detail in a minute. Okay, so let's start with classical observables because this is essentially where this whole story um, starts. Um, and uh, well, in the first instance, we can consider all classical observables. Uh, among those, well, there are those which can be described by smooth functionals. So we focus on uh, those for now. And uh, yeah, oh, sorry. Uh, for simplicity of notation, I'm also going to drop this um, M everywhere. So we are working on a fixed space M, probably hyperbolic one. And we want to be able to assign them to regions. So there is some notion of localization. So. Um, we can define something called uh, the space-time support. Uh, and this is essentially given as, uh, well, points, neighborhoods, uh, regions in space-times where uh, if I perturb uh, the field configuration by something which is supported in that region, then the functional notices the difference, so to say. So this is the region where the functional is sensitive to perturbations. All right. Uh, in particular, we have local functionals, so those that can be written as an integral of a function on the jet bundle, which depends on the on the finite jet at a given point. So, um, and now, uh, well, so that's the kinematical side. These are the observables. And now the dynamics is introduced by some version of Lagrangian formalism. So we use the notion of a generalized Lagrangian, which is a Lagrangian density with a cutoff. Uh, and uh, well, this is something we need to avoid problems with non-compactness of our space time. And also if we want to go around Hague's theorem, which um, is essentially the statement, well, you know, in uh, quantum field theory, doing interaction picture uh, does not work. Um, so, but one of the main assumptions is that the interaction is extended over the whole space time. This is not the case for us because we initially introduce a cutoff. So what do we do? Well, so here a Lagrangian is actually a map which takes a cutoff and spits out the local functional. And well, the space of cutoffs is obviously smooth compactly supported functions. And here are some examples. So the free scalar field, so the cutoff is here. It just multiplies the Lagrangian density. This is Young-Mills, and this is the Einstein-Hilbert action. So a uh, local functional uh, can also then, any local functional can be used to uh, write down uh, an example of such generalized Lagrangian. And this is given as follows. So just multiply uh, the field configuration by uh, F, by this cutoff. And well, because that's a very simple way of, you know, getting those generalized Lagrangians, 
I'm, I'm just going to completely blur the difference between local functionals and generalized Lagrangians. I will just use the same notation for both. Okay, so how do we get the dynamics out of that? And, and let me start with saying, well, uh, you know, how, how do we uh, define a sort of variation of the Lagrangian, of the generalized Lagrangian? Um, so here this delta L is the finite variation. So we fix um, sort of background configuration phi, and we want to take a variation by compactly supported psi. So this is in the space of compactly supported fields. And then, uh, well, we take the difference between the shifted and unshifted um, Lagrangian evaluated at a cutoff. And it's important that we take the cutoff so that it's equal to one on the support of this perturbation. And if we do so, then this object here, uh, delta L, does not depend on the choice of the cutoff. So as long as, well, this condition is satisfied, this is essentially the consequence of locality. Uh, and this can be then used to construct the Euler-Lagrange derivative. So this I will denote by DL. So we take, well, one over T here, and then this finite difference and take the limit to zero if exists. This gives us um, the derivative at the point. Um, all right, so uh, that's the definition. Well, this DL essentially gives us the equations of motion, but this delta L is actually also going to be used later. Okay, so the equation of motion is um, given by the condition DL of phi equals zero. So the space of solutions is the zero locus of this one form. So DL is actually a one form on the space of configurations. And uh, well, the equation for phi is essentially some differential equation. Uh, well, again, we are looking at local uh, actions. So that's what comes out. And we assume that this differential equation is normally hyperbolic for our purposes. Okay, so that's dynamics, now the symmetries. And here, um, well, on the infinitesimal level, we want to think of symmetries as vector fields on uh, the configuration space, and they act uh, on functionals as derivations, as well one would expect from vector fields. Um, and we use a bit of, um, well, formal notation uh, in analogy to uh, say finite dimensional case. So let's say we want to write down the directional derivative of F with respect to X. So we would do it in sort of this uh, basis fashion. And we use the same notation also for functional derivatives. So we can see this analogy between these two formulas. Um, and again, well, we just take the derivative of F, we get, we get to one form, and then we just contract it with the vector field. In particular, we can also say, uh, well, what happens to the generalized Lagrangian, in particular to the one form we get from the variation, and we can also contract it with X. And um, yeah, if we uh, notice that for some X, this gives identically zero. Uh, so, well, morally speaking, this means that, you know, the Lagrangian uh, is constant in that direction. So this direction corresponds to a symmetry of the theory. Okay, um, so that's the overview of the classical uh, structure. I'm going to refer to it later on. So now we want to use this classical data to do something uh, well, in the direction of quantization. So uh, first of all, uh, well, we, we want to have some sort of uh, factorial approach there. Uh, so very similar to, uh, well, you know, the uh, spirit of locally covariant quantum field theory where uh, one works on the category of um, globally hyperbolic uh, manifolds with some extra data. Uh, here we want to enrich this a bit, so we consider our uh, basic objects, so objects in our category of, of space times, as pairs 
where one is globally hyperbolic space time and the other is um, Lagrangian. So, um, well, that kind of motivates the name dynamical space time. So this is space time plus some background dynamics. And the only thing we want here is that, uh, well, apart from obviously being local, um, we want this to be of this form. So L0 is a kinetic term. So something that comes from uh, a globally hyperbolic metric and then uh, plus uh, extra. And this extra can be uh, nonlinear, can be some complicated function of the field, but we don't want this to have higher derivatives than the first derivative so that um, it doesn't ruin uh, the hyperbol global hyperbolic normal hyperbolicity of the equations of motion. Okay, so that's a dynamical space stem. Um, and we also have some class of morphisms if we want to like, complete this data into a category, but I'm just going to leave it out. Um, just think of you know the sort of basic object as dynamical space time rather than just a manifold. Uh, and then to each of these, we can associate, uh, first of all, the space of local functionals. Um, again, we want to restrict to those that um, uh, upon adding uh, a functional from this space, we again uh, get, um, I should be normally hyperbolic, sorry, um, normally hyperbolic uh, equations of motion. Uh, so that kind of limits what we can choose. And then, uh, well, as I said, from local functionals, we can construct um, generalized Lagrangians and those would form the space of potential interactions, so int of ML. So think of it as interaction terms that we can add to L. So L is sort of the basis Lagrangian, and then we can add to this interactions. Now, nobody said that L is supposed to be quadratic. It doesn't have to be. Uh, so one can consider this story of you know, adding interactions and considering sort of perturbation of a theory, which is not necessary quadratic. It can happen at um, various points. Um, okay, so yeah, so so here uh, somehow the philosophy is really to think uh, in, in terms of those interactions or you know perturbations of L as as key objects in in the formulation. Um, uh, so we are going to use them now to label those uh, unitaries that I already uh, announced. So. Let's see, um, here is the notation. So again, the subscript belongs to, uh, well, this dynamical space term. S would then be one of these unitaries. So again, S comes from local S matrix and F is a local functional there. There is a normalization condition uh, and here are the relations. So first of all, we take the uh, sister algebra fully generated by those unitaries. And then we require, uh, well, locality slash causality relation, which, um, well, also goes by the name of causal factorization property. Uh, and this is kind of interesting. So if we, well, have a collection of uh, three interactions such that F and H have supports, which, uh, well, do, do not, uh, so, so F is, let's see, so F is, uh, does not intersect the past of H. So uh, F is uh, later or uh, equal at the same time to H. Um, then uh, this S matrix should uh, factorize in this way um, and kind of independent of G. So G is here only the spectator somehow in this situation. And there is a bit of a subtlety here. So one should uh, use the notion of, um, well, so this is the J minus here is the, the pass light cone. Uh, one should use the pass light cone uh, from the metric, which is um, induced by L plus G. So remember that G could potentially change uh, 
the kinetical term, but we require that it changes in such a way that the new metric is also um, globally hyperbolic. So what could happen is that, well, this, you know, perturbed uh, Lagrangian, so L plus G has a different metric than L. So here in this factorization property, we should use that perturbed metric. Um, I use the word perturbation, but obviously at this stage, it's not, doesn't have to be in any way infinitesimal. So these are all finite perturbations and uh, finite differences. Especially here, when we look at dynamics, so I introduced this um, quantity uh, delta L before. So uh, this is taking a shift of the generalized Lagrangian and then subtracting the unshifted one. So this is kind of the finite difference from the equations of motion. And um, we can also apply the shift operation to any uh, local functional. So the dynamics somehow here is um, well captured by a relation which is, um, well, something like uh, Schwinger-Dyson equation. So unitary version of the Schwinger-Dyson equation. Uh, and well, you can actually check this if S would be the usual um, local S matrix from PAQFT, uh, from perturbative algebraic quantum field theory, uh, differentiating with respect to psi, you would get the usual Schwinger-Dyson relation. So this is just a finite version of that. And it does already contain some dynamical information about the theory. Okay, so two, two relations uh, for now. And as I said, there is a motivation from PQFT. And uh, let me spend a few words uh, talking about that right now. So um, yeah, so let's take a dynamical space then where uh, this Lagrangian is actually quadratic. So I will call it L0 and it induces um, normally a hyperbolic uh, operator in P. It has retarded and advanced green functions, and we can also use them to uh, construct a commutator function. Uh, and uh, well, as usual, we can add to it a symmetric part and get a two-point function of a Hadamard state. So this is the usual way to uh, go about constructing things. And we can also get the Feynman propagator by taking the sum of retarded and advanced plus H. Okay, um, and this Feynman propagator is then used to define time ordered product. So we have this nice operator of differentiating and contracting with delta F. Um, and well, so for N arguments, uh, for N functionals with uh, pairwise disjoint supports, we can uh, write the formula for the time ordered product this way. Um, if these are local, um, this is all well defined, very nice. Uh, but it does rely on the fact that the supports are pairwise disjoint. So if we want to consider coinciding supports, then we have to use uh, Epstein Glaser renormalization to renormalize these quantities because, uh, well, Feynman propagator is singular, so it has its own problems. Uh, so yeah, so this is what epstein glaser renormalization does when constructs those TNs inductively by extending certain distributions. And well, essentially one postulates a bunch of axioms and then at each step you show that if the axioms hold up to order N, then you can construct the N plus one iteration. And yeah, this is essentially distributional extensions. Uh, and one of the important properties, and I would say, well, the key to make this whole procedure work is the causal factorization property. So it says that if you have a bunch of these arguments that are not later than um, the rest, then this time ordered product factorizes in two pieces. And uh, this is actually uh, then crucial uh, to show that, well, appropriate family of those TNs exist. And then you can use them to define uh, the local S matrix as the time-ordered exponential. And finally, 
uh, that factorization property implies the causal factorization property for the local S matrix. And this is exactly what motivates uh, the causality relation from the buchholz frenhagen approach. Okay, so now uh, where does the renormalization group come in? So obviously uh, this construction of TNs is not uh, unique. So there is certain ambiguity there, and this ambiguity is governed by the stuckerberg pietermann renormalization group. Um, and, uh, well, you would say, uh, okay, so how do, we, <laughs> how do we deal with that ambiguity? Is this a bug or a feature? Uh, in a sense, you can say it's a feature uh, because, uh, well, there is a nice group action uh, that, well, characterizes that ambiguity. And uh, there is the main theorem of renormalization um, that tells us that, well, there is this renormalization group that acts on, uh, well, it's essentially the group of maps from formal power series in local functionals back to formal power series in local functionals. So these are these formal diffeomorphisms of the space of local functionals. Uh, and uh, on one hand, we can say that if we apply an element of that group to a local functional, uh, then we can construct another, uh, well, valid local S matrix. Uh, but also if we have another definition of T, so another valid extension of the time ordered product T tilde, then the S matrix for T tilde, so the time ordered exponential thereof, uh, can be written in terms of uh, the old uh, time ordered uh, prescription, so T, uh, by means of some element of this renormalization group. So there exists Z so that this change of time ordered product is absorbed in the change of F itself. So that's the story. And the physical interpretation is that uh, applying this Z, you can think of as adding finite uh, counter terms or changing values of uh, coupling constants. So this really does capture the idea of randomization. Okay, so that's uh, what I would call, well, the old story. Um, now, a slightly new bit of uh, story, which we added in this paper with uh, Romeo, Michael, and Klaus is, uh, well, how, how to, how to, you know, formulate this kind of idea for, for these unitaries uh, in our approach. So we have those local S matrices now seen as those unitaries that generate some abstract sister algebra. So what is the renormalization group? Um, okay, so again, well, we take the sort of axiomatic approach. So we formulate this by, well, requiring uh, some properties for um, this group. So, uh, okay, so let's take some uh, dynamical space time ML. Um, and then uh, this renormalization group is the set of bijections now of uh, F log, so the space of local functionals on ML, uh, which satisfy the following conditions. Okay, so first of all, there is the support condition. Uh, invariance of the support. So this is pretty uh, standard. So some, well, localization properties essentially. Uh, now locality slash causality, again, there is something which corresponds to this causal factorization property, but on the additive level. Um, there is the dynamics, again, something to mirror this dynamical property coming from the schwinger dyson equation. There is uh, the behavior under field shift. Uh, and again, it's kind of easier in if, well, we are working with L, just the quadratic part, then we can say that Z is essentially invariant under shifts. In general, this is somewhat more complicated, um, but again, there is a natural property to ask for in that context. And we don't want Z to change the causal structure. So we call that causal stability. Uh, okay, so, and, and this is essentially it. This, uh, well, summarizes what uh, we mean by renormalization group. 
and now the question is, well, what do we do with it next? Uh, so in this paper, we used it for two things. So first was to use, to prove the time slice axiom version for our uh, net of algebras. And the second was to um, formulate, well, our version of Nutter theorem for the action of symmetries. And this is what I want to focus on right now. So I want to present uh, in the example we looked at how uh, symmetries can be described. And it turns out that, uh, well, renormalization group, uh, the notion of renormalization group is actually crucial there because uh, we might actually encounter anomalies. And uh, even in this non-perturbative framework, obviously one expects that the anomalies are still there. Uh, so we have to be able to um, take them into account. Okay, so here is the model. This is the model we uh, discussed in that paper. So we have the configuration space, which is N real scalar fields. So N component real scalar field, you can also say. Uh, and well, the group of symmetries here, uh, well, this is the semi-direct product. So we have compactly supported deformorphisms of M and then uh, crossed with, uh, well, essentially compactly supported uh, gauge transformations. Well, 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 you know, we have um, compactly supported maps on M uh, valued in the affine group of Rn. So we essentially, what we can do is to, um, well, shuffle around the components of uh, the real scalar field. So this is uh, that bit. And then, uh, well, obviously there is, uh, you know, group uh, law for such symmetries. Again, everything breaks down into this uh, semi-direct product. And this acts nicely on uh, fields and on uh, functionals by a pullback. So no surprises. Uh, so this is the obvious action. G star is the obvious action. Now there is a less obvious action, uh, which kind of plays nicely with uh, the way we formulate, uh, say, for example, um, the schwinger dyson equation. So there's another action which also involves the transformation of L. So here it is. Uh, so this depends on the choice of this background Lag Lag Lagrangian. Uh, so we take this finite variation of L uh, with respect to the symmetry. So we, well, we transform it by G and subtract L and add then uh, just uh, the transformed F. So this is L-dependent group action on local functionals. And now we want to see how th these symmetries uh, behave under quantization. So in perturbative uh, theory, we have the master world identity, which guarantees that uh, classical symmetries remain unbroken. Um, if it's satisfied, right? So we want to have control over that. So the question is, well, okay, so, you know, what, what's the abstraction for that? And again, in perturbation theory, uh, this is the anomalies. That's how we find anomalies. And, and here, uh, this is again, well, described in, in this uh, more unitary fi finite framework. Um, but still can be done. So there is a nice analogy of this concept. Uh, so we try to first describe abstractly what, what can be the de deviations from master world identity, uh, whatever it is. Um, so uh, we describe it in terms of a co-cycle. So we have maps zeta from this group of symmetries to the renormalization group. So we say, well, you know, there could be some, uh, well, classical symmetries could be broken. So there could be some corrections, quantum corrections to classical symmetries, uh, but these then uh, somehow would correspond to, uh, well, something in the renormalization group. Uh, 
so okay so let's start with those map zeta so first of all uh let's just define the space of all such maps uh which satisfy the following co-cycle relation which is then given in terms of um again this action of g and uh let's denote the set of all these co-cycles by zeta m l so now we can formulate the unitary anomalous master world identity so for a given dynamical space-time uh, we say that a representation of uh, our dynamical algebra a of m l satisfies this unitary anomalous master world identity if um, there exists a co-cycle such that uh, well the action of the symmetry on uh, this S matrix by pulling up, pulling back the Lagrangian uh, can be absorbed into um, applying this renormalization group transformation to that Lagrangian. So now imagine if uh, this co-cycle was just the identity, sorry, uh, if this uh, co-cycle would always map to uh, the identity in uh, the renormalization group, uh, what would that mean? It would mean that on the right-hand side, well, we don't have this guy, we have just uh, the S matrix in the representation. So if that's the case, then we can say that uh, this quantum S matrix right in this representation is invariant under the action of this symmetry. Uh, so in other words, if uh, a symmetry is unbroken, then, uh, well, this value of zeta g is the identity. So that, that's how we would say, well, this is anomaly free. Uh, the fact that this co-cycle is non-trivial is then uh, reflects the existence of anomalies. So we can think of it as some kind of anomaly map. Okay, so we have that definition. So this essentially says, well, yeah, so this distinguishes a class of representations. Uh, with relation to these co-cycles. And now we can um, use that to further portion things out from our uh, dynamical algebra. So let I zeta denote the intersection of all the ideals that are annihilated by uh, representations which satisfy this unitary anomalous master world identity for a specific zeta. Um, and let then this a m l zeta so we add uh, one more label here be the quotient of our original dynamical algebra by this ideal so in a sense now we can say that you know our uh, generators are unitaries plus uh, something in this ideal okay um, in particular uh, we can look at the could say slightly trivial situation. So if we have uh, F, uh, oh, so yeah, now that the symmetries we're looking at were compactly supported. So if we have F with the support, which does not coincide with the support of the symmetry transformation, then obviously, uh, well, you could think that things are becoming slightly trivial, um, but not entirely. So if you look at what the unitary anomalous master board identity says, there is still a contribution here corresponding to the value of that uh, co-cycle, uh, well, renormalization group element applied to zero. We don't require that this is necessarily zero. Um, and what is it? Well, so again, for f equals zero, so this is the most trivial trivial case, uh, we have the following relation. So if we just take um, the shift of the base Lagrangian, um, then, um, well, it spits out uh, the S matrix evaluated at this uh, co-cycle at zero. So the information it captures, if you think, well, uh, if you think in the analogy to the path integral, say L is your quadratic Lagrangian and S arises in the path integral approach, then this would essentially correspond to um, the Jacobian when you change the variables in the path integral. 
So the zeta g of zero is in fact the logarithm of the Jacobian corresponding to the symmetry transformation g. So in, well, in principle, there is no reason for that to be zero. And uh, furthermore, uh, we can look at the infinitesimal ver version of the story. This is also what we've done in the paper in the example section. And then we observe that uh, sort of first order term, when you, you know, expand this co-cycle, you can well, think of G as an exponential of some vector field. And then if you uh, look at the first order in, well, expanding in, you know, powers of, of that vector field, uh, we get uh, that this um, first order is just the BV Laplacian from the BV formulas. Okay, so there is now a kind of full circle between uh, what I started, uh, well, uh, what was, okay, so there was the perturbative AQFT motivation, then there was this newer approach, uh, again, renormalization in both approaches, symmetries in the new approach, and then we go back essentially to what we know about the symmetries in, um, well, the PAQFT uh, version of the BV quantization. Uh, and, and because that's something kind of close to my heart, uh, BV quantization, I want to uh, spend uh, a few more slides by explaining that connection. This is a bit more of the old stuff, but, uh, well, it's still correct. So, um, but before that, maybe, uh, yeah, just wrap up this story uh, with the main result, which um, is the unitary Nitter theorem. Okay, so uh, let's see again what uh, we have. So we have, uh, sorry, let me go back here. So we have this unitary master word identity. Um, and again, I said that if um, this co-cycle uh, gives you an identity at a given G, then the symmetry is unbroken. Uh, so let's start with defining a subgroup of the group of all the symmetries, which uh, corresponds to uh, those symmetries that leave the background Lagrangian invariant. Uh, and we drop the support restriction here. So now we are really looking at uh, all the symmetries. Uh, and uh, now we can see how these uh, act as automorphisms of the dynamical algebra. And hence, this also induces the action on the quotient when we also take these renormalization group co-cycles into consideration. So this action is denoted by gamma bar here. And in particular, we can consider the unbroken symmetry. So the situation uh, where, well, this uh, action of the co-cycle for a given symmetry uh, is trivial. So uh, yeah, so we have the unbroken symmetries and then we have in particular the symmetries uh, where the anomaly co-cycle can be locally trivialized. So, so these are, these are the best ones. Uh, and for those, we can formulate uh, the unitary uh, Nitter theorem, which tells us that, well, symmetries of this sort uh, induce unitaries, which then implement the action by automorphisms uh, in the dynamical algebra. And this unitaries here, are essentially, uh, well, you can think of them as um, the, the, the S matrix, the exponentials of neutral charges for, for these symmetries. So, so this is the sort of, um, well, the simplest formulation, uh, but we also have the anomalous formulation. So for symmetries, which can be broken, uh, but this gets a bit more technical. Uh, but again, we have some sort of uh, unitary action 
but then those unitaries don't correspond in an obvious way to, well, in a simple way to neuter charges. Uh, there is also the involvement of this renomization group action uh, in the middle. But yeah, I'm going to leave it uh, for uh, the audience to look up in the paper because that would be um, a bit too much to try to explain. And just to finish off, uh, I wanted to well make the connection to uh, my earlier work on the BV formalism. So uh, yeah, I guess I have about 15 minutes. So let me just remind you, BV quantization, uh, the main idea is to, you want to characterize the space of symmetry invariant on shell, so on the space of solutions to equations of motion, functionals using cohomological methods, sorry for the typo. Um, and the idea is to extend the original configuration space to a graded manifold. So uh, in the first instance, you, you add the space of gauge parameters understood as well, odd variables are also called ghosts. And then the VV complex is the algebra of multivector fields on that extended configuration space. And there is also a differential, which has two pieces. One knows about the equations of motion, so that's delta, and one knows about gauge symmetries, that's gamma. And then the neat trick is that the cohomology of that operator gives you exactly uh, the space of symmetry invariant on shell functionals. Um, and this is pretty useful. So, uh, well, in the context of perturbative uh, algebraic quantum field theory, uh, there was, well, the initial work on BRST-like methods was uh, the paper of uh, Ditch and Frenhagen on observables in QED. And then uh, this whole BV story entered in uh, the paper of Stefan Holland on Young Mills, uh, where this was, the whole machinery was fully developed. Um, and then, uh, well, further generalized in my paper with Fren Hagen, where in particular we introduced that uh, renormalized BV operator. Okay, so that whole story is pretty well known by now. Um, and yeah, so, so the bits which I want to mention, uh, which somehow are related to this new perspective, um, have to do with things like classical master equation uh, and the quantum master equation. So first of all, well, in the classical story, uh, if we are working with multivector fields, then we have the natural notion of a bracket. So the commutator, essentially, of vector fields. Uh, and then, uh, well, these differentials uh, can almost be written as derivations with respect to this bracket, but not quite. So they can be implemented by generalized Lagrangians with a particular uh, choice of cutoff. So again, we do that trick that we choose the cutoff to be one on a large enough region. Um, so yeah, so this BV operator is in fact just implemented by um, some extended Lagrangian. So again, we can extend this whole framework um, with Lagrangians and so on uh, to things that live on graded manifolds. Um, that's not a problem. You can also, you know, characterize uh, fermions, odd generators, and so on. And uh, important equation number one here is the classical master equation, which guarantees that this uh, differential is in fact new potent. So uh, it has this nice um, form of a master equation with the ante bracket. Okay. Um, now, quantum master equation. Uh, so that's something which is going to be uh, important for the quantum theory. So we have some classical symmetries and now we want to, um, which are described by the classical BV operator. Now we want to construct the quantum BV operator. So the linearized guy uh, is again, just implemented as the bracket with 
the quadratic part of the action. Again, this can contain now all these extra things like ghosts, anti-ghosts, anti-fields, and so on. Uh, but this shouldn't bother us too much. Uh, and the quantum master equation is now uh, a condition of the invariance of uh, the local S matrix. So this time ordered exponential of the interaction with respect to this um, linearized quantum BV operator. Again, something that should be expected because in perturbation theory, these guys are constructed from free fields. And this is the sort of symmetry of the free theory. Um, okay, and then if you work on this a bit, then uh, you realize that uh, this, in the regular case, when V doesn't, well, is regular, so uh, as a functional has smooth derivatives and everything is well-defined, then we can write this equation in the following form. So, uh, yeah, so we have the bit which looks like classical master equation plus an extra which is quantum because it has h bar. So uh, unless as one usually does h bar is equal one, then you don't find it so easily. But yeah, so this is the collect correction from the classical master equation, which um, we can identify. And again, in the regular case where everything is well-defined and nothing needs to be renormalized, then this is given uh, in terms of something which looks like a Laplacian. Uh, so maybe let me uh, explain this notation. So uh, we have the second derivative here. This is the field and this is the corresponding anti-field. So because everything is, um, well, essentially multi-vector fields, so functions on uh, the cotangent bundle, the anti-fields are sort of genera generators in the cotangent directions and, and fields live on, on the base. Uh, and this is, yeah, something like a Laplacian, right? It looks a bit like a Laplacian, um, only it's graded. Uh, okay, so this is typically uh, very divergent. If we were to try to write it down uh, on a local functional, this doesn't make much sense. Uh, so uh, it has to be renormalized. And well, so here is now, the standard way that people write quantum master equation, or you know, it's not it's not our, our invention. It's it's an old uh, concept actually. I mean, this all goes back to the seventies and the works of Batalin and Bilkovitsky, and there is a lot of uh, subsequent work on on the more physics side of things. So, I think especially I found the works of, um, of the book of Anoa and Teitelbaum very useful. And uh, yeah, the subsequent papers. Uh, so there, there is a lot that has been done in that direction. Some of it is maybe more formal than the rest, but the ideas are there. Uh, but yeah, the, the big problem has always been, well, this object is uh, not very well behaving if you apply it to, to local things. Uh, hence, the whole story needs renormalization. Um, but okay, let's put it aside. So let, let's see how far we can push it with the regular things. So uh, we can also define the quantum BV operator. Oh, I think I didn't introduce something which is actually in the hindsight important. So uh, in um, perturbative AQFT, we have uh, something like Muller maps. So we have maps which intertwine the uh, free and interacting, field, interacting theory for a given interaction V. So we use those to um, deform the free BV operator to the interacting one. Um, and this guy is then, uh, well, the BV operator, the quantum BV operator of the full theory, and it characterizes the quantum gauge invariant observables. Um, so let me just write uh, the, um, the formula for it. Uh, so without going into the details, what's RV? Um, assuming quantum master equation holds, then this S hat 
uh, can be written as follows. This is a bit complicated. I apologize for that. Uh, so there is the time ordered exponentials of the local S matrix. Uh, there is then the action of the uh, well, the quantum, uh, the free quantum BV operator given by this bracket, and then uh, this kind of again time ordering with uh, well the inverse of the S matrix with respect to the time ordered product, uh, and again. Uh, you can compute what that is and find out that, uh, again, assuming quantum master equation, this is local and actually also very nice. So it's given us the classical BV operator plus, again, this quantum correction coming from the BV Laplacian. So it's really worth it to understand what it does. Uh, okay, so for me, a useful... Uh, piece of literature there was uh, the paper of Brennecke and Dutch on anomalous master word identity and also the paper of Stefan on quantization of young mills where this question is somewhat uh, well answered I would say uh, so here we are uh, we have this non-renormalized time ordered product and we have well uh, we can formulate these uh, typical, you know, objects of the BV formalism. Uh, sorry, I have to go back a bit more, uh, like quantum master equation, right? In terms of the something time ordered and the action of a differential. And then also the quantum BV operator, again, something time ordered and the action of the BV differential. So uh, let's, let's just, you know, replace the time ordered product with the renormalized time ordered product, why not? So let's use these things as definitions. So this is what we did with the paper, the paper with Klaus. Uh, and then you can use these nice papers of René Kaduch and uh, of uh, Holland, where they have shown uh, that the anomalous master word identity implies that this guy here, uh, so the action of the differential on uh, the S matrix of the time ordered exponential with the renormalized time ordered product uh, has a very similar structure to the renormalized story, but then you replace this BV Laplacian by what people call the anomaly term. Um, okay, so, so here is now the full story. So uh, in this approach, the anomaly is, um, can be identified with what comes from the BV Laplacian. So the anomaly term is the renormalized BV Laplacian. Uh, on the other hand, well, this renormalized BV Laplacian uh, in, in the sort of, uh, you know, more formal path integral formulation uh, should be, uh, again, the first order term uh, of the logarithm of the Jacobian of the symmetry transformation, which then connects to uh, our new formulation of the anomalies. And we have also shown in this recent paper with uh, Brunetti, Dish, and Frenhagen that, uh, well, this is, this is actually how it works. So uh, if you write down the sort of PQFT version of uh, our co-cycle and then look at the first order perturbation, then we find exactly uh, the renormalized BV Laplacian there, uh, aka uh, the anomaly term from anomalous master word identity, which again, you know, does the full circle because um, it, it, well, it's an indication that our unitary anomalous master word identity is doing the right thing. Okay, uh, so let me conclude. My time is more or less up. Um, so yeah, so classical symmetries either survive the quantization and uh, induce exact quantum symmetries or are broken and then uh, some anomalies appear. And these are characterized by this co-cycle zeta, uh, which tells us exactly how classical symmetry is broken. And uh, the unbroken one can be implemented using, uh, well, some unitary, uh, and that has been proven by means of 
um, well, unitary uh, Luther theorem, but also broken symmetries uh, can be implemented by unitaries, but uh, then the story is a bit more complicated. Okay. I think the time is up for me. So thank you very much for your attention. All right, uh, thank you very much. Any thank questions? You. Well, perhaps I may ask a question. Uh, yes, please. Um, so I could not quite make the connection between the two parts of your talk that you said. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so in the first part, um, as far as I understand, you assume that you have a, a, a normally hyperbolic equation of motion. Yes. And you discuss symmetries. Oh, okay. Okay. But then, sure. of course, if you have gauge symmetries, uh, yeah. then you don't have those normally hyperbolic equations. Yeah. Right, sorry, I was just a bit fast and loose because it's a <laughs> it's a short talk. Well, no, the talk was was long, but uh, that part of the talk was short. Um, yes, yeah, so here I uh, already assumed that somebody did the job for me, or I did it in in the previous stage, so that this in this configuration space I would throw in the whole sort of. Um, well, multiplet uh, with ghosts, anti ghosts, and uh, Nakanishi Lautrum fields, and then this extended uh, action here already contains uh, the gauge fixing term and the ghost term, and that one gives you the normally hyperbolic equations. So, 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 so I, what, yeah. But this is what you throw in into, so to say, the action in the first part. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is what they do in classical theory, right? So in classical theory, you know, I start with, uh, well, this, you know, say Young Mills action with symmetries, and then I turn the crank and I get this full extended uh, Lagrangian that comes from the BV formalism, and then I can throw that into the quantization machine. Okay, but then you have already gauge fixed. So, so what what is the symmetry well, that you know? I mean, consider? fixed fixed is maybe a bit of exaggeration, uh, because uh, there is. I mean, I, so I would say the following. So, as long as I work in this full extended framework uh, where anti fields are not set to zero, uh, the gauge hasn't been actually fixed. Uh, because there is always, you know, the, the freedom to like redefine the anti fields, which would change the gauge fixing, right? So the gauge is only fixed really when I go to the level of cohomology. So as long as I keep the full extended theory, right? I mean, this has a very nice sort of geometrical picture, which is unfortunately not entirely correct if you try to do it in different dimensions but it's still very nice so so you start with your original configuration space then take the cotangent bundle so you have something larger and then uh, you this introducing this gauge fixing fermion is essentially redefining changing your variables which would mean that instead of say you know integrating over your your original configuration space you integrate over some other Lagrangian submanifold of this odd cotangent bundle, um, and and yeah, so 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 that that is essentially kind of change of variables uh, there. Uh, but obviously, it's important to do that. Otherwise, we don't have normally hyperbolic equations of motion, and we have a problem. Um, but and, until you know the, the last step when I take the cohomology, I still have a freedom to 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 change change the gauge, change the gauge fixing. Sorry. Um, so it's yeah. I would differentiate between uh, sorry between say being gauge fixed and having. Uh, added a particular gauge fixing term. Sorry, this is very confusing, but uh, yeah. <laughs> that, does, it, does it answer your question somewhat? 
somewhat. Somewhat. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, the, the symmetry is always the full BV symmetry. So uh, yeah, it has the BRST part, it has the equations of motion part, and the anti fields are still present. Mm -hmm. So. And until the end. Yes, but I mean, that is uh, a discrete symmetry, but you talked about symmetries as vector fields. That's, sorry, what did you say? I, I lost that. Uh, that is what? Yeah, so, but, but this is one thing that, that, that I was uh, not really understanding. So, uh, the BV or BRST symmetry, that's a discrete symmetry, but you were talking about vector. Back, continuous symmetries. We talked about vector. Oh, oh yeah, no, yeah. Oh, sorry. So, of course, I mean, yeah, so uh, yeah, that, that th these are th this is more like an analogy at this point, right? So, because this, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. so this bit is really about perturbative treatment. Uh, so I think that the connecting point is really uh, just arriving at, at this, um, this renormalized BV Laplacian. So this is really the connecting point because, I mean, the treatment of symmetries and the quantization procedure is different. I mean, it has some analogies, but this is sort of intrinsically perturbative uh, for many reasons. Um, and yeah, so so that that's only on the matter of of analogy. But uh, this object here, uh, the anomaly. Um, is the same anomaly that you would, well, it's the same number, right? It's when you compute the anomaly in, in these various approaches, you get the same thing. Um, so it's, it's really, uh, yeah, that different ways of making sense of that uh, logarithm of the Jacobian of the path integral. I, I think that's, but, but it's, it's a helpful, let's say it's a helpful heuristics. Uh, in in many ways, and and well, that I think well we, maybe we have even more to say about it on our our next paper, but it's still not finished. So, <laughs> but maybe maybe next okay. seminar. I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> yeah. So 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 that, that we also like clarify things like West Sumino consistency condition and how, how these things work together. Thanks a lot. So more to come. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, I don't see any. So thank you again, Kasia, for this yeah. talk. And um, uh, Jochen will uh, update the program. Bye. See you. See you. Thank you. See you, Johan. <laughs>